Hello everybody, and welcome back to my ranking of the Elden Ring mini-boss difficulty. If you missed part 1, check out the gauntlet of easier enemies felled via the link in the description. Without further ado, let's jump right into part 2. Number 15, Guardian Golem. By the time I found the mini-boss edition, I'd faced these a dozen times throughout the overworld. Simply be an ankle biter and dodge its mighty blows, easy peasy. Or it would be if its strikes didn't have gargantuan hitboxes. An example being the slam into the ground, then pull up for a painful AoE. This dungeon variant was one I missed in Limgrave, so I'm sure it would have been tougher had I found it early on. I'm sure you were even more troubled if you stumbled upon the trap chest sending you to the Divine Bridge Golem, scaled at capital level strength. I did fight plenty of these on par with my current level enough to respect their damage, the great bow variants that have god tier aim, their sizable HP, and their moderate resistance to being knocked down even if you do pummel their ankles. Number 14, Cemetery Shade. Of all the gangbangs in a shoebox Elden Ring offers, my first encounter with this teleporting tyrant was the most egregious. Taking it alone, it trades pitiful defense and HP for fast, high-damaging attacks with bleed and the ability to phase in and out of existence on a dime. Fought solo, this can be managed somewhat well, though it's tricky to time offense to ensure you don't fall victim to its quick flurries. A bad barrage with bleed attached to it can spell instant demise, though with proper execution, it's not all that bad. When you add in a brain sucker like stun for a few seconds, two skeletons with typical swiggity swooty pursuits, and a third skelly archer to boot, you've got bullshit brewing. Between the skeleton combo flurries, dive attacks, periodic archer shots, stun magic from the shade, and its own dangerous offense, you hardly have a window to do anything other than dodge and pray. It's made all the worse by skeletons requiring a final hit after defeat to stay permanently dead. The window to do this before they revive is rather short and has a delay before the bones are vulnerable. That means not only do you need enough of a window for a killing blow, you need to wait for the short delay, then hope you have an opportunity in the short gap before they revive to end them. And that's just one of the three, not to mention the boss. This felt like a band-aid over a mini boss with a single gimmick and paltry HP. When fought alone, it's only lethal for its high damage if you make a mistake. Considering its merry band of undead alone, it might have warranted top 10 billing. Number 13, Electo, Black Knife Ringleader. Blistering speed has never looked so effortless. Electo's glides in and out of range appear almost supernatural. It works against your favor when he blinks away, but it is a boon if you can time a perfect poke as he dashes back in. These exchanges are key since his agility lets him recover from staggered blows. His combos are lengthy, which is balanced by some solid openings. His best is his slam into the ground with him chilling for a bit afterward. The grab is another, though that does require a depth evasion. The attacks to truly fear are his Malaketh moves, using range slices and a burst of them up close to burn through your HP. This active battle asks you to find attentive balance between momentary lulls, then snaps into non-stop action. Far and away the most demanding mini-boss so far, Electo signals an upward spike in difficulty. Number 12, Ancient Hero of Zamor. There's a reason these don't appear as standard enemies until an endgame area. While my Great Club plus 8 and swap to a Great Axe plus 3 got reasonable stagger and damage, I was getting destroyed in spite of my endgame stats. These Zamorian warriors have a wide array of combos with hardly any downtime between hits, then has the speed to dash out of range before you can counter. While its AoE burst, forward breath, and ice tornado aren't deadly alone, it's the slow buildup of frostbite that layers harsher damage on you in league with the fearsome combos. You can block sure, but that lets frost build. While some attack strings leave barely any room for you to safely dodge between blows, let alone get your offense in. I imagine if I had faced the mini-boss variant early on, I would have been devastated. Even with my own high stats, the ancient hero lived up to the threat its later brethren pose in the mountaintops. Before you venture into the frozen wasteland, consider taking advantage of today's sponsor, Chimera, to dress for the occasion. Like your finest fashion souls, Chimera uses only premium materials, inspecting each carefully and handpicking the best of the best. They've got some sick graphic tees, hoodies, jackets, and God's gift to lower body comfort, joggers. Personally, I love the idea of rocking the moon man while we embrace the coming age of stars. Chimera has lightning fast shipping and satisfaction guaranteed with a full refund policy in 30 days, no questions asked. Their pricing is competitive with top-notch brands with equal or better quality, and they're offering 10% right now on any orders using the coupon code The Democracy. Check them out via the link in the description. Big thanks to Chimera for sponsoring today's video, and thank you for listening. Number 11, Erdtree Avatar. 
If FromSoft was willing to do an asset reusage crab rave, you knew damn well we'd be seeing an Asylum Demon remaster. The Erdtree avatars that guard most minor trees fit the bill. Using primarily swings we've all seen in some capacity before, you might be surprised to see the avatar rank this high. There's a few reasons for that. For starters, they string combos together more effectively than past models. In addition, smacking that booty is no longer entirely safe due to their lateral range. The Magic Butt Slam adds a forced evasion segment, the status effects for later variants force you to mind your footing, and Horseback is brutalized by its wide swings. Despite thinking I had what it takes to easily take down hordes of avatars, I found a combination of those criteria plucking a life or two most times I faced one, which is enough for them to nearly crack the top 10. Number 10, Abductor Virgins. My only encounter against a miniboss variant of these terrifying trappers was a duo bout. As a solo endeavor, they're quite imposing. Featuring pizza cutters or cleavers, these Iron Maidens have incredible range, potent damage, insane closing speed, high defense, and a grab to be wary of up close. That grab is your chance of big damage if dodged correctly, as the innards take far greater damage, but that counter is quite scary to pull off. When you're hardly prepared for trouble and making it double, good luck protecting yourself from abducted devastation. These tyrants were one of the most fearsome standard foes you could find in the wild. The only reason the duo battle doesn't rank high is their mixed passivity. It seemed the Cleaver Abductor was comfortable fighting from range while the Pizza Cutter Edition attempted closer assaults. If they had both been all out offense, you'd be in for a world of hurt. While you can avoid some of that pain, there's still plenty to go around anytime you encounter an Abductor. Number 9, Worm Face. Awaiting you at Creepy Forest End is this death bearing battle. With most of the minor Erd trees guarded by the aforementioned avatars, stumbling upon Wormface and his blighted minions was horrifying. Nearly every attack is accompanied by spewed worms that build a new death ailment that, you guessed it, kills you upon filling with one of the most metal death animations ever in the series. Balancing how to get damage in, keeping an eye on his oversized tells, not to mention his multi-swoop grab attempts, and constant careful positioning to avoid the overwhelming blight building around you had this spooky brawl shooting my stress level sky high. I won't pretend the fear factor doesn't play a role in amplifying his ranking, but it's fair to consider when it impacts my ability to execute. For that, Wormface bores his way into the top 10. Number 8, Royal Revenant. A poison spewing, relentless, whirlwinding melee monster with tremendous speed in a tiny room? Yeah, this thing would have bowled me over multiple times if not for endgame stats. It hits multiple times with its many swinging arms, body slams, and poison. With immense tracking, it removes your ability to take advantage of its behind, exacerbated all the more by minuscule downtime between its assaults. This makes every attack and flask chug far more costly than normal, especially when you add in how often it feels like its whole body is an attack hitbox, making even touching it a colossal threat. It's possible I'm overestimating it, but the fact that it would have easily killed me twice had I not had 50 vigor, and its dungeon is somewhat early, I imagine this being a nightmare at balanced levels. Number 7, Bell Bearing Hunter. If you want a barometer for how this ranking compares to the boss ranking, you can use this hunter as a measuring stick. A reskin of Elamer of the Briar, the Bell Bearing Hunter is an exact copy with one notable difference. Rather than being behind a fog wall, he invades you suddenly when traveling to certain sites of grace at nightfall. Beyond that ambush, he poses the same challenge as the Briar battle. Hefty damage, great closing speed with the Great Shield Bash, and insane range with his psychokinetic combos. I found them quite difficult to read, with some slashes having hardly any gaps, then suddenly having a large delay before the next strike. My strategy for victory was similar to Elamer, all out offense to mitigate his own offensive strengths, a gambit that shortened the battle in my victory, but shaved off plenty of my own lives before I could pull it off. Number 6, Deathbird. With how many times this nocturnal bird can appear throughout the world, I'm surprised I only found it twice. Those two battles were enough for me to understand why it's called Deathbird. Serving it up on demand, this monster and its rolling bird fetuses love to stagger lock you into a world of pain. The Deathbird's aggression is quite high for a foe receiving help from allies, though I do believe its earlier battles I missed are mano a mano. Even when its allies go down, its range is immense, making horseback without iframes fairly tough. It turned into a gripping battle of attrition that I won sheerly due to level. That was not the case in the mountaintops, where a variant with added magic assaults showed how painful its blows can be. Even when I fought on foot, the front was rarely safe due to raining pecs down from the head. Whether up close or afar, it has an answer at every range to put pressure on you. It makes getting your offense in difficult even when you use torrent to quickly close the gap. A balance kit worthy of a nod just outside the top five. Number five, Grafted Scion. 
I'm happy to see the return of the one-shot pass or fail tutorial boss with a reward. It's especially neat that you can use an imbued key in the four belfries to get back there at a stronger level so the reward isn't completely time-gated. Even if I love that design choice, I hate this wombo combo slinging scion. It easily trounced me in the tutorial. When I encountered it later in Stormvale Castle and Mount Gelmir, my added experience and build didn't really matter. It still sliced and diced me with ease. I had more resources to outlast the Battle of Attrition, but I still didn't feel like I actually won. Without a doubt, if there's a single mini boss I didn't feel like I actually learned to fight, it's the Scion. The only real winning method I used was to recognize which unending flurry with insane range it's about to unleash, run away, then swoop in for a quick joust, and bail. Sure, you could roll through or block everything, but that won't be happening in the tutorial without flawless execution. If you do want to do it early, I recommend the Samurai. It has enough arrows with the power of Mighty Shot to take it down from range. That I need to resort to such tactics to have a chance shows how much I struggled with the Scion. An easy choice for a top 5 with tremendous difficulty. Number 4, Crucible Knight. Speaking of early game challenges, sticking this guy in the first ever jail a lot of players will stumble upon was brutal. With HP, defense, and damage scaled well beyond what newer players could feasibly handle, Crucible Knight's Crusade is noob stomping. Not that veterans are safe. Though his design does rely heavily on the Silver Knights, he has plenty of shakeups to surprise longtime players. While having all of the advantages of those knights, such as delayed attack delivery, massive range and damage, and strong poise, he adds in magical tail slaps during what appear to be openings. This can happen during normal combos or after his flight, after which he mixes up the surprise further with two spins in a row, the second having huge range. If you fight him up close, without adept evasion and masterful stamina management, you'll meet certain defeat. You can parry if you're bold enough, though the risk is quite high. I settled for baiting combos and shield bashes while poking away. A coward strategy to be sure, but one that worked. Later fighting the spear variant with even greater range, magical thrusts, and slams, I had to get good when it came to dodging and countering. That well prepared me for their duo battle, one that I did find very tough, but surprisingly not insanely so. Their regular appearance throughout the game honed my skills against them, a testament to how study of enemy patterns and mastery of them becomes forged into the player over time. Even if I eventually reach that nirvana, my first experience against Crucible Knight was a beating I won't soon forget. Number 3, Tree Sentinel. With Grafted Scion Swift Victory and Soldier of Godric being the human embodiment of a whoopee cushion, the first true gauntlet of difficulty most players will face is the Tree Sentinel. Like Crucible Knight, despite his early appearance, his HP, attack, and defensive power seem scaled to be fought after more exploration. I, of course, said nonsense and attacked him immediately like I'm sure a lot of players did. Despite practice in the network test months ago, he still smacked me around for nearly a dozen deaths with that halberd. He features everything you'll come to fear about Elder. Elden Ring's bosses. Early tells with delayed, quick deliveries, huge range, high speed, a wide variety of combos, and even utility that makes certain builds suffer. In his case, the Great Shield can be used to block magic, a brutal counter with so little FP early on. Not to mention choosing an Astrologer, Prisoner, or Confessor will lead to one-shots from some attacks with the lower vigor. There are plenty more chances to fight variants over the course of the game, each with their own new wrinkles such as ranged lightning magic, or gank variants that are more absurd in action than our duo of Crucible Knights. That's putting aside the two magical copies that stand in as greater foes. Much like Crucible Knight, my experience paid off in the end. Even so, the early beatdowns are hard to forget. Number 2, Blackblade Kindred. Another boss variant spread throughout the world as a mini-boss and even a basic enemy, these Black Blades are every bit as ominous as their valiant counterparts. Trading in the poison passivity for a constant onslaught of offense, losing those moments of reprieve arguably makes fighting them individually tougher. That's also putting aside that in every instance I encountered one, their overall stats were scaled well beyond what the gargoyles offer. You do at least get the opportunity to fight on torrent, though their wide swipes are likely to knock you on foot before long. That and certain attacks almost demand iframes or blocking to have a chance at survival. Looking at you, Twinblade Whirlwind. Due to their wings and size, their ability to close the gap is instantaneous, along with blows that'll reach you even if you try to bail on horseback. I found that getting your own offense in aggressively was key due to how inconsistent I was at avoiding their damage. Without a doubt, it's the mini-boss encounter I feared the most any time I stumbled upon them in my journey. That is, with the exception of my choice for the number one hardest boss in Elden Ring, Falling Star Beast. 
Falling Beast Parl over here without the paper limbs is a rodeo that ravaged me without end. It has speed on par with the fastest enemies in the game, hitboxes with an insane radius, making being anywhere near it almost always unsafe, and magical assaults and giant tail slaps with rock spam to follow making any range dangerous. My inability to find proper openings against Falling Star is on par with some of the hardest encounters in the entire game. No matter when I would try to attack, it always seemed as if the gap was too small and I would get walloped in return. It takes reduced damage anywhere other than the head, but for a melee build, it holds it too high for a lot of attacks to hit. Admittedly, I underutilized jump attacks in my first playthrough, so perhaps that was the answer. If it was, I'm still not sure when I would have pulled them off. I felt there were hardly any opportunities for regular light attacks, let alone leaping into its face in range of its pincers. I thought horseback would be a big advantage when I encountered it on Mount Gelmir, but it turns out attacks like the tail swipe demand iframes and were hard to read in time to hop off the horse and safely dodge. So instead of just me getting clobbered, me and Torrent got demolished, leaving regular occasions for more punishment as I sat on the ground like a turtle contemplating my life decisions. Compared only to the grafted scion, this is a mini boss I have no real answer for other than sloppy offense and enough resources to outlive its punishment. For beating me since time and time again without any answer for future battles, this beast of difficulty is easily my choice for the hardest mini boss in Elden Ring. But of course, that's just my opinion. Which of these felled enemies gave you the most trouble? Let us know in the comments below. Subscribe to stay tuned for quality boss rankings and community rankings soon to come. And of course, I want to thank you for watching today. Much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.